My name is Perry J. Dahl. Uh, they refer to me as PJ. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a retired Air Force Colonel from the United States Air Force. I retired uh, from the military in 1979. Uh, I initially joined the service uh, when a, a, a unit that I was a member of, the 41st Infantry Division, uh, was recalled to active duty in 1939. I was uh, 17 years old, a uh, junior in high school, and along with several of my friends, uh, it was the, 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 the uh, aggregate decision of our parents that uh, one year in the military would do us good, even though we had not completed our education. We did finish high school while on active duty uh, with the 41st Infantry Division. They permitted us to go to a night school in a local town uh, close to Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, with, with the advent of Pearl Harbor, uh, the 41st Infantry Division was not uh, disbanded after its year. Uh, and uh, uh, I had the opportunity to apply for aviation cadet training become, uh, to get, become a commissioned officer. Uh, the criteria was to pass two years equivalent college, uh, have uh, a display the dexterity required uh, uh, for pilots, and uh, to pass uh, the f a very uh, rigid physical, involving primarily uh, eyes, ears, uh, sight being the, probably the most important. Uh, my vision was 2015-2020, uh, 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 it, it was very sharp. And uh, 17 years old, uh, I, I was in good physical condition. So I was accepted to become a, a, a cadet in the program. However, they didn't uh, have a position for me right then to get into pre-flight school. My unit, 41st Infantry, was uh, uh, sent overseas, but in that I was a candidate for uh, commissioning, uh, I stayed at Fort Lewis, Washington as a member of the 3rd Infantry Division until uh, going to flight school. I did the uh, standard pre-flight training in Santa Ana, California, uh, primary training flying Stearman, uh, and, and then uh, basic training, flying Volte vibrators, BT-13. Subsequently, I was selected to go to Twin Engine Fighter School at Williams Air Force Base. Uh, we feel, and maybe uh, th this, this is debatable, however, the consensus was that while in basic training, it was pretty well determined what weapon system you were going to be associated with. And we all strove uh, to be uh, fighter pilots. And uh, I was accepted uh, uh, to go to a fighter pilot school because I, what I felt that my accomplishments is basic training. A little side note, uh, while in basic training, uh, I, felt, I, I never had any pink slips. I was just doing fine all throughout the training. But the final flight check, my instructor came over to me and he says, you know, he says, you have a great future, your, your coordination is great, and et cetera, et cetera. He said, uh, we got one last flight here before you go. So uh, uh, we went out to the airplane, and I had to take four cushions to put behind me, as I always did. And I, uh, I had neglected on the pre-flight to release the rudders so that they would come up. They were still extended. And I was too embarrassed to tell him that I, uh, I couldn't hardly reach the, the, the rudder pedals uh, uh, because that's part of a serious part of your, your pre-flight. So we went and did acrobatics and flew all around. And uh, of course, uh, uh, without being able to fully extend the rudders in all directions, it was a pretty sloppy flight. And when I came down, he was very disappointed. And he said, you know, I don't know what happened to you, but he says, I hope you just had a bad day. He said, nothing I can do about it now. I put you through uh, for fighter training. So uh, uh, I did go to fighter training. And afterwards, uh, I went to him and I told him, uh, just, just to make him feel good, I said, look, I can really, I can, I can fly this airplane coordinated. And I told him what I did. And uh, he gave me some demerits right there on the spot. But uh, uh, it was too late, I, and, uh, but I, I did have to walk those tours off in, in, in advance. One other thing, uh, speaking of tours, I uh, did have to, uh, while we were in 
pi, uh, 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 pre uh, let's see, uh, uh, primary training, flying the Stearman. Uh, we, were, we had all finished our, our, our courses. We had a lot of ground loops because the Santa Ana winds would come across. Uh, we were in Ontario, California, and uh, a, a lot of kids were, were ground looping. And I had, uh, I had an outstanding instructor. I, I think he, uh, if I recall, it was the th he had the third license ever issued uh, for pilot uh, certification. He showed me, uh, he drilled me all constantly about how to, when the, air, when the tail of the airplane got caught in cross, serious crosswind gusts and everything, uh, how, to, uh, how to stay on a runway and how to prevent the ground looping. And uh, where 67, 80, 90 percent of our guys were ground looping, wasn't hurting the airplane an awful lot, but uh, I had not done any of that. But on our last flight, there was another gentleman named Dickey. And I got with Dickey before we took off, and I said, uh, we were going solo, I said, hey, let's, let's uh, sneak through the mountains here and go over on the other side of the pass, and let's have a little dogfight, you and I. Strictly forbidden, of course. So we ziggied over there and uh, uh, over toward uh, uh, Edwards Air Force Base through the Cajon Pass, and I latched onto him, and he latched onto me, and we were zigging around just having a great time. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, comes this Lycoming equipped PT-13 who was the uh, Lieutenant uh, Whitehorse who was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian who was the, uh, the, the overall military advisor and instructor, did all the check rides uh, at, at our base and he caught us dead to rights. I tried to get away but we had the, Cont the Continental engines, he had Lycoming and he, he ran, he, he caught me before I got back and he got licensed and I got, I got my number. And when we landed, he was waiting for us. <clears throat> so we had uh, kind of a court martial hearing the next day, and I told Dickie, I said, look, let me do the talking. Dickie was a real nice guy, but he went all fast with the mouth, and I kind of felt I was maybe a little bit better than he was. We, uh, uh, we met, uh, they were all civilians, with the exception, of course, the lieutenant who was, who, who was the prosecutor, if you will, about uh, washing us out. We completed all of our training. Uh, th this uh, uh, would not have been unusual to uh, dis dismiss people for uh, uh, these types of things and for even less things, disciplinary actions. Uh, so w we were kind of worried. And uh, we went before the, uh, the tribunal, if you will, and I told Dickie, I said, uh, let me handle this, you know, and, and, and uh, when, when he... Uh, uh, they said, what do you have to say for yourself, the two of us? And I said, uh, well, sir, <clears throat> we, uh, uh, we were discussing our uh, uh, tactics and uh, everything about flying this airplane uh, one evening, and, and we, uh, we said, well, I'm having a little trouble doing this, and he was having a little trouble doing that. And I said, I'll tell you what, let's go out, and I'll, f I'll fly off to the side, and you slow roll, and I'll tell you if, you, if, if you're slipping, and uh, I'm no sooner to get through than, than, than Lieutenant Whitehorse goes, he says, he's lying. He said, he jumped, and, and the tribunal uh, chief said, Lieutenant, you'll have your turn, just sit down. And then I said, yeah, uh, okay. And then I gave this guy kind of captain, like, a, why don't you, or this Lieutenant, why aren't you believing me, you know? And I, I, I went on and I discussed how we did all these things, we checked each other. I said, now if you, you notice on my knee pad when you come down, you'll notice on that, and I showed him knee pad. I said, you see how I graded him? Of course, I did this all after I got on the ground, you know. Yeah, and this, this lieutenant kept leaping up and leaping up. And the more I talked, the madder he got. And the madder he got, the more the, the uh, civilian who was running the flight school got on the lieutenant. And he finally told the lieutenant, he said, if you don't shut up, I'm going to ask you to leave. We are the ones who are going to make the decision. And you, you know... So uh, by the time this lieutenant got up and, and he was babbling, so he, he said, he said, those two kids are lying. I don't care what you, and he, and he, he uh, was very, very insulting to us. And as a result, to make a long story short, we were not eliminated from the program. However, I can't recall, but I would think, I, I, I'm gonna say that we had maybe about 150 tours we have to walk, which is an hour with a rifle around someplace 
and I, I, I marched those off in basic, and then he added another 25 in basic. And before I could pin on the gold bars, I had to finish 12 tours walking around Williams Air Force Base around the, the, the unit. Okay, uh, uh, when I got to flight to uh, 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 advanced school, uh, we flew an AT-6. Uh, we flew uh, a thing called an AT-9, which is which, uh, a Curtis airplane. And uh, we, we, they wanted us to be proficient flying this airplane. It was a very hot airplane. And uh, uh, we had to do full flap, flap landings with it. And it had uh, uh, a clear canopy on the top. And uh, whenever we flew this, whenever you did full flap landings, you, your, your approach was so steep that you had to look out the top of the airplane in order to see the runway. And it was very tricky landing this thing. Uh, the reason I say this is because we transitioned from there into a, a, a we were the only unit that had P-38s in advanced training. It was called the RP-322. It was an aircraft that we had given to the Brits, uh, and the props all, all uh, turned in the same direction. Later on, the air airplane had uh, uh, counter-rotating props. It had no turbo, turbo, so it was limited in altitude. And I guess we sent them over to the Brits, and they said, no way, and because uh, they had a very fine airplane over there, uh, the Spitfire. And uh, they sent them back, and so they slapped them in our school. Uh, we had no, uh, uh, there, there was no way you could uh, make the things dual. So uh, the first flight in, the P, in my P-38, which was uh, RP-322, uh, was, uh, and for everybody else there, was uh, taken without any instructor aboard the airplane. They just stand on the wing, explained all the instruments to you, and told you what the, uh, a few things, and you closed the canopy and you went. Uh, we lost uh, uh, three men there, uh, uh, losing, uh, losing engines on takeoff. Uh, two most dreaded things uh, uh, for a pilot uh, in flying P-38s is one, losing an engine on takeoff, is very critical, especially not in that airplane. Uh, especially later on in the in, in the war effort, where you're carrying a couple of 1,000-pound bombs or, or uh, uh, fuel tanks, and the other, of course, is uh, a mid-air collision, uh, because uh, by the very mission of flying fighters, you're darting around the sky with other airplanes, and, and, and mid-airs are, you know, very uh, not beyond the realm of possibility. Following uh, my training at, uh, at uh, Williams Air Force Base in the RP-322, we went to what we call RTU, uh, uh, wherein we uh, uh, flew the P-38, which was quite a step up from the R-3 P-22 because of the, uh, of the uh, turboprops and the props turned in, uh, in counter-rotating. And uh, we flew at, uh, this, uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. While there, uh, uh, Joe Foss, who was the leading Marine ace, was operating with Corsairs right adjacent to us. Uh, I think it was out of Palmdale. It's right in that area uh, in the, on the Mojave Desert. And we used to take great delight to go over. And uh, we had little doors uh, uh, in, in the bottom of the P-38 that, that retained your, your, uh, your brass so that when you fired, all your brass wouldn't run out and you, you could retain it. And we'd, we'd stuff that, those little doors with, with toilet tissue and we'd fly over his base and pop and toilet tissue would fly all the field. And then the Corsairs would come out and we'd, we had a lot of fun uh, playing with them. And uh, uh, one of my first, uh, I first learned this as the attributes of a P-38 with the twin engines was in that humongous sun that shone the Mojave Desert. As soon as that, uh, the Corsair was a, was a fast airplane, it, had a, it was a very good bird. And as soon as one would latch on, I would uh, climb into the sun, kind of shield, shield my eyes and just climb into the sun. And you could take that P-38 right up and uh, go, go to almost zero uh, airspeed without it ever falling off right or left. But you'd climb and, and that Corsair would start climbing after you. And uh, pretty soon when he got down to maybe 110 or notch or something, and he would just stall out and have to drop out. And you'd just sit there. I'd watch him in the rear view mirror. And as soon as he stalled and went down, when he pulled out of that thing, guess where I was? At his 6 o'clock. <laughs> so uh, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, I saw Joe Foss quite a bit later on several occasions. Uh, I think everybody knows who Joe is, a congressional medal winner. And, and uh, he was the governor of South Dakota. And a, a great gentleman. Uh, following that training, uh, I went as a, re uh, as a replacement to the 55th Fighter Group 
He was stationed in the state of Washington. We had a squadron at Payne Field, Everett, Washington, a squadron at McCord Air Force Base near Tacoma, and one down at, uh, at Olympia, Washington, which is the capital of the state uh, out at Olympia Airport uh, uh, in a little town called Tumwater. Tumwater is famous for Olympia beer. Uh, Olympia beer, uh, their slogan is, it's the water, and uh, uh, we were right adjacent to the Tumwater Brewery. It was a great place for fighter pilots to be because you didn't have to go too far to find the brewery. We, uh, uh, the 55th Fighter Group was, uh, uh, these gentlemen had been flying the P-38 since its inception. They were, uh, they were precision pilots. They used to take off f uh, flights of two. We always took off in formation land f uh, flights of two, an element of two. And uh, they would tie their wings together with, with string and, and uh, take off and go on a, on a low level mission or whatever and come back, and that string would still be there. They, uh, they were really precision pilots. They, they really knew the airplane. A lot of those gentlemen flew the, uh, ca came down from the Aleutians where the P-38 was introduced in combat up there for the first time, and they were very experienced guys. They're all our flight commanders and our flight leaders and our element leaders, and all the rest of us that we came in there from flying school, we augmented them as, as, uh, as wingmen. Uh, a requirement came for uh, personnel to go over to, uh, uh, as replacement, rep replacement pilots, uh, and we went to the uh, Pacific Theater. They needed them there, and they had a fly-off to see which one of us was most ready to go over. And uh, none of us replacement pilots had gone to the 55th group were really all that great. We, we, uh, we were up there for less than three months. And uh, uh, we had a fly off and I, al uh, myself, along with uh, Joe Forster, uh, kind of won the fly off over everybody else and we were selected to go uh, over and we went over and we joined uh, the, the 475th uh, fighter group at Dobadura in New Guinea. Uh, 55th, uh, the 475th Fighter Group formed as the first P-38, all P-38 fighter group, uh, in Amberley Field in Australia. They uh, went from there to Port Moresby, went from there, leaped right over to Dobadura. <coughs> uh, the, the war was still very, very much in doubt. Uh, the Australians were very concerned. Uh, the, the Japanese were, were, were right uh, at, at the door. Uh, of the Owen Sandy Mountains to go over in, in New Guinea. Uh, New Guinea, as you know, is divided into a British New Guinea and Dutch New Guinea. Uh, and the, uh, 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 the war effort was very intense. We went in as replacements. Uh, Joe Forster uh, and I are good friends right to this day. Uh, Joe, uh, I, I'm sorry, was born white-headed. And uh, he, 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 looked, uh, he looked old, and Joe's a little bit older than I am, a year or two. And, uh, but he, he was still, he was maybe in his early 20s, uh, 20, 21, and I was 19 or so. When we reported, and we reported to, a, to the commander uh, of the Force uh, 32nd Squadron, or where, where we were uh, assigned. I'm not gonna mention the squadron commander's name because I'm gonna say some things uh, that may be a little derogatory, and I, 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 I don't want to cause any problems uh, in, in that regard, but uh, we, we reported to this commander, and he looked at Joe, and then he looked at me. You know, I'm all of, of uh, five foot five, you know, and uh, weighed 130 pounds or something, and Joe is all white-haired, and I looked like maybe 14 or 15, and his remarks, of course, were, my God, they're sending us old men and kids and uh, Joe always remember that, and he tells that story. Okay, so, we, uh, so there I was with the fourth, uh, 30, uh, four, uh, uh, 30, uh, fourth, <laughs> I'll, I'll get it right in a minute, uh, 475th Fighter Group at Dobadura. The first missions we had uh, w was against uh, Rabal, which is on New Britain. Rabal was very, very heavily defended, a lot of shipping in the harbor. Uh, they had uh, the enemy order of battle the day we went up there was, uh, was like 200 to 1, 200. Uh, Japanese uh, zeros expected. Uh, we had to fly from Dobadura to a little island called Carowina where they refueled us. We, they had a little strip hacked out of the jungle. They'd slapped down some PSP, which is pure steel planking, uh, on the jungle. And they had, uh, they drifted in some 55-gallon uh, uh, drums full of av gas. We burned, uh, if I remember, I think it's 135 octane fuel. 
uh, and we stopped at Carowina, refueled our airplanes, and went on to the, to the strikes at Rabal. Uh, <clears throat> from there, uh, we, we loved to accompany the B-25s on any bombing missions because they flew so much faster, uh, so you didn't have to weave around when you, when you flew with the heavies. We traditionally, in our squadron, we had, uh, our fighter group, we had three squadrons. Each squadron would rotate as to their mission. For example, the first squadron, one squadron would go in on a fighter sweep. They'd go in before the bombers and everything to clean out anything that they could get. And they're the ones that always got in the fight. And uh, uh, so the, either the 431st, 432nd, or 433rd had that. And that's the mission you always wanted to go on. And of course, that's the ones that uh, all the squadron commanders wanted to fly on and all the rest because you had the most likelihood of, of getting uh, some real good action against the Zeros. Uh, the other airplane, uh, the other squadron would, would fly close cover and the other one would fly top cover with the bombers. And you didn't run off chasing, bo uh, chasing fighters when you were assigned to uh, escort uh, the bombers. So uh, you didn't have the opportunities, uh, although as, as, you know, as, as zeros would come in uh, after the bombers, you had, had the chance to brush them off and everything. But you didn't have a, as much opportunity to uh, engage in air-to-air -air combat. Uh, with, with that mission as you would on a fighter sweep. Uh, my first mission, I went in there and we, uh, we went in as top cover. And uh, we had, uh, uh, in the P-38, in case you didn't know, instead of having a stick, it had a yoke. And in the States, uh, your trigger finger on your index, right index finger, you use a trigger finger to engage the uh, uh, 50 millimeter can uh, guns, uh, correction, 50 caliber machine guns, of which we had four. And we had one 20 millimeter cannon in the center. Uh, all of these concentrated in about a six inch circle at 300 meters and uh, uh, with, uh, devastating. Uh, uh, the, the impact of that, uh, so, uh, but what we did in the States, we, uh, your index finger would operate the, the, the machine guns and when you ostensibly started hitting the thing you were supposed to cut in your cannon with your thumb, well, over there in combat, they rigged everything on one. When you pulled a trigger, I mean, everything fired. They rearranged the, uh, the button, uh, the buttons on this yoke. Uh, and so, you know, we had trained in the States and we, uh, where all these buttons were. And of course, when we went over to combat, they, they changed it. And us, theoretically, well, you know, we would change our pattern. Well, old habits are hard to break. And, uh, uh, again, making a long story short, when we got into, got into combat, the first airplane I saw, the first thing I saw was uh, this is a zero coming at us, and there were a lot of zeros all over, but this one was coming, closing on us real good uh, at three o'clock, and I called uh, my uh, flight lead, and I said, uh, you know, you know uh, I think it was, uh, we were tailing Charlie, and I think it was a blue uh, red leader, I said, uh, you know, bandit, three o'clock, high. Well, I, I got as far as Bandit because in, when I pushed the button to ap operate the radio, they had re we'd rearrange the buttons and I dropped my tanks, my belly tanks. So and I'm talking to nobody and my, both my tanks fall off the airplane, which, which is good. We were going to drop tanks anyway. Problem is I forgot to select internal fuel and it gets very quiet because all of a sudden instead of sucking off the belly tanks, I'm sucking off the air <laughs> and both engines quit of course, and nobody heard me say anything, of course, because instead of pushing the radio button, I'd push the drop tank button. And uh, being ultra intelligent and young and active, I knew exactly what I did, and I f switched to internal fuel, and the, uh, the engines roared back to life. And by that time, I didn't know where anybody was. And I soared around the sky trying to find somebody friendly, and uh, uh, Fireballed everything. I was, I was going through four or five hundred mile an hour up and down and around looking. Uh, zeros were coming at me, and I thought uh, so I, I, I finally looked out and I saw a, a bunch of B 24s uh, airplanes. So I ran over. <laughs> I figured they'd know how to get home. Uh, I was completely disoriented. I didn't know which way to go. North. All the way up there, all I'd been doing was looking at this guy's right ear flying his wing, and all of a sudden he wasn't there anymore. So uh, anyway, uh, to make a long story short, uh, a very, very futile, ineffective mission. And when I got home, I just had two holes in the airplane, uh, nothing bad. 
Um, and that was my introduction to combat. Well, needless to say, I got a little bit better as time went on. Uh, I think uh, I shot down my first airplane, I think a fourth, fourth, fourth or fifth mission uh, over uh, Alex, uh, Lexus Haven near Lake uh, uh, in New Guinea. We, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, our squadron commander, and, and uh, God bless him, he, he's still alive, uh, but uh, uh, I was on a mission uh, again over, over Lexus Haven. Uh, being still uh, on my fourth or uh, fifth or sixth mission, and we, uh, I was tail end Charlie on the flight of 18 airplanes, and we were over, uh, uh, went uh, on, on this mission, and uh, uh, we got over uh, Alexis Haven and lay in that area in New Guinea, and uh, the zeros were in the area. They were called out by various people, and we, uh, a lot of cumulus clouds all around, which uh, uh, that time of year had a, a tendency to build over the, uh, over the land mass. And uh, uh, the squadron commander uh, started uh, climbing when the zeros were called, because we were only about 15, 16,000 feet. He started climbing, trading altitude, uh, trading um, airspeed for altitude. Uh, bad, bad choice. Uh, fighting the Zero, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about the attributes of the P-38, uh, and uh, it had a lot of, uh, you had to fly the airplane correctly or, or else uh, it wasn't effective. Uh, so uh, uh, we were trading uh, uh, airspeed for altitude, and I'm sitting back there at tail end Charlie, about ready to fall out of the sky, the last guy, and uh, again, uh, he, he called drop tanks, and again, like the good soldier I am, I drop tanks. But again, I forgot to switch to internal <laughs> fuel. <laughs> and uh, uh, you'd think you'd learn by now, but I hadn't. And uh, so the, again, it got very quiet in the cockpit. So I, uh, 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 I, I rolled her over and dove to the deck, of course, to keep from falling out of the sky. And I flipped back to internal fuel. And the engines roared to life just like they're supposed to. Of course, by that time, again, I've lost everybody. So I called, I, I told him, I said, uh, you know, I didn't tell him that I forgot to switch tanks. I said, uh, had a little trouble down here, and I, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I can't see you. I lost you. So he, he, uh, Clover Red Leader called and said, take it home, go to home plate. Well, this time I had enough sense to know which way was home anyway. So I, I started home. And I started home, I looked up uh, at my uh, 10 o'clock position and uh, high, and here came this lone zero. And I thought, aha. So I was going to wait for him to get in pretty close, and I was going to turn into him because, boy, in a head-on pass, I'll take one every time with that, with that P-38, all those uh, uh, 50 caliber and a 20 mic mic all going right uh, in one in a six inch circle. So as I was turning, uh, uh, waiting, watching him, I'm going to turn into him, and suddenly uh, uh, I, there was some, uh, in my peripheral vision to the right, uh, there was some flashing, and I looked out, and there was this uh, Zeke, uh, which is a type of zero, uh, you know, maybe 30 meters at my 3 o'clock. And I, I, all of his guns blazing, I could see him. And he had me for lunch. There was just no doubt about that. So instead of taking the shots and rounds in the cockpit, uh, I threw that right engine up into him, and he just riddled that right engine <coughs> all the way down the boom, threw a, blew a big hole in the back of my uh, my. Uh, a horizontal stabilizer, and uh, I look up in the rearview mirror, and uh, I was just streaming. It looked like white smoke all over the sky as I dove for the deck. Uh, 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 the fight had gone out of me. I was no interested, no longer interested in that other zero. <laughs> all I want to do is get the hell out of there. I poured the coal to it, dove for the deck, and fortunately, with that airplane, you could do this. I outran the, the guy, the, the zero, easily. And uh, the engine uh, uh, started to freeze up, of course, uh, as, as all the temperatures went in the red line. I let it go uh, long enough so I, I didn't want it to uh, go on fire. And I'd looked all around, and uh, no zeros were around. <clears throat> and there was no basis, no, no problem going home as far as running into any zeros, as far as I could tell. So away I went. These zeros, uh, incidentally, were uh, accompanying uh, some bombers. They were making Japanese bombers making runs on lay. So I, I figured that they would be uh, uh, sticking with their bombers pretty much. So I feathered the dude up uh, without any problem. And uh, 
Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the problems, of course, with the inline engine uh, in any uh, P-51, P-40, any of them is uh, vulnerable to gunfire because of the coolant. <coughs> uh, a, uh, the, the most serious thing that happened to that engine, the reason I lost it was when he blew that uh, big hole in my horizontal stabilizer, a lot of flak and pieces fl flew up the tail boom and went into the radiators that I had. And that's where I lost all the, all the hydraulic fluid. Uh, the hits on the engine, uh, uh, I, I don't know if they'd have knocked it out or not. I had some, some oil lines uh, nipped, and, and, uh, but I, I could have probably got a lot further without uh, having to feather that engine up if it hadn't been for, for losing all that coolant. Uh, but that's the problem. You've got to run all those pipes back to the radiators, back to the engine to keep the engine cool and uh, very, very vulnerable to gunfire. So I feather the thing up and uh, 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 I guess maybe, you know, 30, 10 or 15 minutes later, uh, my element leader caught up with me and uh, he'd seen this action and he, he saw this white smoke all over the sky. Because we, we always tried to maintain, uh, we always, uh, it was vital that we maintained at least two ships together all the time. We never broke down. That's one of the reasons, one of the tactics we deployed in, in fighting the Japanese and I'll cover a little bit more on that. In any event, we, uh, I, 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 we flew back. Airplane flies great on one engine. Uh, uh, you know, you can't get into a fight or anything like that, but uh, as far as being stable, climbing, descending, turning, you always want to turn into the good engine, of course. Uh, but uh, as we approached the field, uh, it was very critical that you had the runway made before you bled that airspeed off too low. And if you got down to landing speed, you better land, because you aren't going to go around. In other words, you, you really can't take off in one inch or go around. Uh, uh, proof of that, uh, as, as I approached the, the runway at Dobadura, the proof of that was over on a little mountain we had off to the right uh, of the strip. We called it Mount Bust Your Ass. And we did that because there were about three or four airplanes on the side of that mountain. And uh, one of the gentlemen who joined, went over there with uh, uh, Joe Forrester and myself, his name was Fostikowski, he had an engine shot out five days before I had mine done, and Fosikowski did not, uh, he, he missed the approach. He tried to go around, and I could see, as I was making my approach, I could see that black spot on the side of the mountain that was Fosikowski, and I, I, I was determined I wasn't, going to be, I wasn't going to make the same mistake. So I, I, I made a reasonable landing and, and, and got, got okay. Um, I shot down a total of nine airplanes, uh, eight of them were zeros, one was a, was a bomber. A lot of people ask me, I say, which do you remember you're shooting down the first one or the second one? And uh, uh, most of the ones uh, I remember, uh, most of the ones I shot down, I don't remember shooting them down. Or let, me, let me rephrase that. I didn't see them actually go down. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when you engage the enemy and you close on him, and you might get some good hits on, on, on the enemy fighter. Fire and smoke and everything would come off the airplane, debris and everything, but you'd never see him go in necessarily. If you stuck right with him and everything, you know, this guy isn't a Mongolian idiot. He's probably calling somebody and saying, hey, there's a P-38 on me. So you had to be very careful. You concentrate too much on that, and the, 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 the worst thing you, well, in my judgment, the worst, uh, the, the big detriment of the P-38 in any fighter airplane is they had the, air, the cockpit faced in the wrong direction. Most all of the fighter pilots that got shot down got shot down from their 6 o'clock. And most of the time you're concentrating on what you're doing out front and somebody comes in your 6 o'clock position and you're a dead man. So you, after, after you blow pieces off of this guy and all the rest, you normally break off and get your head back on that swivel because there's somebody coming after you probably. So the bottom line is, I never saw it. most of these airplanes go in. When you get back to base, your, your wingman, your element leader, or the element behind you, he'd say, he'd say well, you know, I, I got some hits on this guy off the end of the runway. He said, yeah, I was right behind you. I saw him. He, he, he buggered in right on the end of the runway, or I saw him bail out or whatever. So uh, uh, I, I never saw these, uh, a lot of them. An exception? Uh, a gentleman named LeBaron flew my wing out of a place called Hollandia. We were just on a two-ship flight going out to uh, find a destroyer. 
that they were looking for, a Japanese destroyer. So we went out, it was an Intel destroyer, and we went out, he and I, and we located, and we started to come home, and the, I saw, saw this one zero, a lot of clouds in the area, this one zero, and uh, I told the bear, I said, I want to get that, let's go after that mother. So he, he, the zero darted in the clouds, a lot of cumulus clouds. So I darted right in, right, right behind him. Had, it, had no idea where he was in there. Broke out of the clouds, and there he was at my 12 o'clock, less than 50 meters in front of me. Man, I, I'd already uh, uh, test fired my guns and everything. Man, I was on that uh, gun like a duck on a June bug and <laughs> the trigger, and I blew him out of the sky, <laughs> flew through all the debris, had some, uh, I felt some of the stuff hitting me, and down he went, and we went home. Well, I went to lower the landing gear, and I couldn't get the right gear down. Some of his uh, debris had uh, flown underneath the, the, the engine, uh, underneath my airplane, <clears throat> went into the, to the uh, landing gear door on the, on the starboard, the right uh, main gear, and had severed the down lock. And uh, so I, I tried to, I, I lost some hydraulic fluid, which wasn't a big deal, but uh, uh, I had to pump my gear down by hand, which was, it wasn't a big deal, but I couldn't get it to lock. I couldn't get a locking indication. So, so I had uh, LeBaron uh, circled there with me for a while, and he looked, and he said, well, it looks like the gear's down. I went by the tower, and they said, yeah, it looks down to me. So I, I landed the airplane, and, and uh, it was down, but it wasn't locked, and the right gear slowly folded, and I drug the right wing. Went over the top of a revetment and sat down right beside an A-20 there refueling, and uh, I, I jumped out of the cockpit and took off like a scalded rabbit to my right, everything was going to blow. Forgot to take my parachute off, it was banging. But uh, uh, th there wasn't any problem, it settled down. And, uh, but that, uh, I remembered shooting down that airplane, because it's, you know, it was very memorable, and I saw him actually blow up. And l later on in the war in Formosa, uh, I was, uh, I, I caught a, we, a flight in Formosa, we went up there looking for, for whatever we could find out of the Philippines, flying out of Lingayen Gulf. And I uh, uh, caught a uh, Helen bomber, which I think was being served as a transport, taking off, heading back to the homeland. And I caught him and uh, 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 shot him up, and he landed on the run, uh, uh, on the, bellied in on the beach, and we saw all the people uh, jumping out and everything. And we went back and hosed them down and things like that. And I remembered that. But the other, the other victories, uh, I didn't remember. Uh, probably more, uh, in, more interesting uh, than the airplanes I shot down uh, was the P-38s I lost. Uh, I, I told you about the first one I lost where uh, I, I threw that engine up uh, to save me. If I hadn't been a P-38, if I'd have been in a, in a I don't care what airplane, a single engine airplane, uh, that guy would have had me for lunch. I'd have been dead meat. There was no way I could get away. You could slow roll, you could do, do whatever, you, you, no, no way. But throwing that engine up uh, 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 saved me. One other attribute of, uh, 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 of the P-38 twin engine was uh, I was over, uh, we were on a fight. I, I was a, a flying wing uh, and uh, on, on the squadron commander. And uh, we went down over a little place called Weewak, which is a, a Japanese stronghold. We went down through the overcast because somebody said there were Japanese uh, zeros down below. We led the whole squadron down through the overcast, but when we broke out underneath, uh, this, uh, John Loisel and myself were alone. We'd lost the rest of the squadron, and there were zeros down there. I mean, there were, I don't know how I many, 30, 40 of them. We were right in the middle of them. So we thought we'd better get out of there because there's no way two against all that many. So we kind of scissored back and forth to protect each other, and uh, I looked up in that rear view mirror, and that it was full of nothing but red spinner. There was a, an ME-109 type, uh, uh, we call him a Tony, was right on, on my six o'clock. I don't know where he came from. He would obviously dove down because we were, we were moving pretty good. And uh, I, uh, I, again, he had me. There was no way in a single engine fighter that I could have got away. What I did, just instinctively, chopped everything on the right side, the engine, right side, full right rudder, full right aileron, and the airplane almost cartwheeled, if you will. It was some sort of a weird maneuver. I don't know what it was, 
but I lost probably about 150 knots of airspeed right now, and it kind of spun around and everything. And this guy, I, I could just visualize that Nip pilot, his eyes crossing, wondering what was going on. And he slid underneath me, and I looked down, saw him, and he roared away, and I brought the in, other engine back up to speed, and we, we darted home. And, but again, if it hadn't been for that twin engine on, on that airplane, uh, I, I'd never gotten out of that uh, predicament. Twin engine airplane in the Southwest Pacific, uh, the good Lord provided the best airplane in, for, for that theater against that particular enemy. I don't care if we'd have had a late, later model F-51s, Bearcats, a lot of airplanes that came out later in the war, they were superior in, uh, 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 in a lot of ways, but none of them could have done the mission in that theater that, that we, we did with the P-38 purely because it had uh, of the twin engine capability.